guess where I'd like to begin is uh, asking you, each of you to talk a little bit about some of the most significant values, experiences that shape Indonesian culture. Uh, what makes Indonesia unique? Um, I will try to explain. Uh, before, about 20 years, uh, 20 years before Indonesia became independent, uh, there, is a, there are some uh, youth uh, nationalists that uh, have a conference. They have every two years conference. So we know that Indonesia is the, the largest archipelago countries with a consist of 17, more than 17,000, 17,500,000 5, islands with um, 400 different languages. So, um, but at that time, long, long time ago, uh, those um, hero we call them hero, uh, they understand all of uh, all of those differences. We have to be one because we we, we used to under colonial uh, Dutch, and then um, they make a kind of like a youth pledge. We call it Sumpah Pemuda. Which uh, they agree uh, to have a one homeland, motherland, one nation, which is Indonesia, and then one language, Indonesia. So that's the base of how uh, so many differences in Indonesia become one. It's diverse to be one. Um, as Maria mentioned, Indonesia is made up of over 17,500 5, islands. Out of that, about, I think, 6,000 are populated. So it's the world's largest archipelago. And it's made up of many different languages, many different ethnic groups, uh, many different subcultures. Personally, for me, what amazes me most about Indonesia is the fact that you can keep all that together, and what Madia just mentioned is one of the things that binds that it's very easy to have balkanization when you have so many different people. Um, the other thing that really has helped the culture evolve is also, as mentioned by Madia, the fact that we were colonized by the Dutch. They were in Indonesia largely exploiting our resources for 350 years. Um, that has shaped the psyche of the country, um, and it has affected Indonesia in many ways. Again, it's because of the fact that we have so many different subgroups, we were not always united. In fact, the reason we were colonized, the reason anybody has been able to have any influence in Indonesia was because in the past we were a lot of warring people. Um, nationalism, social justice, and yes, uh, democracy, and it's a democracy by consensus. So these are the guiding principles of Indonesia. And one more is you see that emblem, and uh, uh, that's kind of like a, uh, you said it's kind of the banner. That's a uh, Benika Tunggal Ika, it means that united in diversity. So, um, actually, diversity has been there in Indonesia since a very long time ago. And um, uh, if you go to uh, Indonesia to visit one of the states, kind of like uh, Washington and Oregon, you might see so different language, you not even understand each other if you don't speak Indonesian language. So that's a, and uh, one one state they speak so fast and loud. The other state they speak so slow and then uh, quiet, something like that. So that's very very unique of Indonesia. That's one of the unique things. A lot of unique things. So in most countries they have a traditional costume. If you go to Indonesia, we have many traditional costumes. Um, somebody from one part of Indonesia will have a traditional costume that's completely different, will have uh, cuisines that are different, will have a language that are different. This is why Indonesia, in, in most Indonesians' point of view, uh, is, is so unique. And Bineka Tunggal Ika is translated as uh, unity and diversity, but literally it means many but one. Um, 
This next question I really had need in mind because of your consulting with businesses, but either one of you uh, can start with uh, Anita. I guess the question is, if you were had the chance or asked to produce a guidebook for Americans doing business in, in Indonesia, what would be some of the top pieces of advice that you'd want to include in that guidebook? This is actually advice um, that a lot of people in the business community are finding out is critical to success, not just at an individual level, but also as a company, as a corporation. Uh, the very first thing you want to be aware of is the fact that you need to be culturally competent, uh, or at least culturally aware and culturally sensitive, because the cultures are so different from say somebody from the West. Even European and American cultures are different. But if you're coming from America, going to Indonesia, one of your biggest culture shocks would be the fact, for instance, that seemingly people have no concept of time. So my very first advice would be learn a little bit about the culture. And it's not just do's and don'ts. A lot of people think that once you have the do's and don'ts, you're ready. That's basically one-on-one. You're just at the starting point. If you have the opportunity, learn the language. Uh, it's actually a very easy language to learn. Um, actually, a lot of um, business schools right now are trying to encourage their students to learn more about local cultures before they actually step onto you know, the ground. One of the things that there's a report, I'm sorry, but I can't remember who presented the report. One of the biggest challenges to um, in multinational corporations today is the fact that it is so difficult to manage people across borders and also to do business with people who are vastly different from you. I'm trying to think of uh, what else <laughs> I would say. Madia, would you like to add? Um, I don't have experience in business like that. So. <laughs> but um, one thing that I would like to share, um, as for knowledge sharing, because of 350 years under colonialism, uh, the young, uh, the old generation in Indonesia are kind of like a, a because their parents kind of like a parents. So they hesitate, most of them hesitate to speak out. So, so most of them hesitate to speak out. And it is kind of like this. Um, uh, also, your boss told you to do this. And then that's correct. But you know the better way to do that. They will, mostly they will really say, yes, sir, you do. Just like that. So, that's, uh, but now it's, I'm very happy to see the young generation, they, they are now more, more speak up, more, you know, um, have more confidence to say no, or I think this is yes, sir, something like that. Before, no. It's kind of like, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir, just like that. So that's kind of sad, but very good improvement now. Indonesia gained its independence from the Netherlands in 1947, I believe? Uh, 1945. Okay, so it's been 60 years with a still strong characteristic of the culture, the difference. Uh, when I was small, I still see that. Even when I was working in Indonesia before I'm a I, uh, boy, uh, I met here, uh, I still see that uh, kind of like, uh, yeah, it's still there. Yeah. But I, I know that now it's way different. Probably because of the technology, people, um, you know, internet and so forth and so on and so forth. But um, we glad that we see that now a lot of improvement. Even though independence was declared uh, in 1945, we weren't really completely independent. We still had to fight for independence. The Dutch weren't completely gone yet. Yes. Um, we, had, we had the Japanese in Indonesia, we had the British in Indonesia, so we basically had to fight for real independence for another maybe at least 10, 10 more years. And um, when, when the Japanese left, the British came in. They were the ones who accepted um, the surrender from 
from the Dutch. But with the British, the Dutch uh, former colonial Netherlands were able to come back. And so they were trying to recolonize Indonesia for some time. And um, if you read about the history of Indonesia, there was still some very um, famous struggles, including um, so when, when right. So uh, in 1955 was when they had um, elections, and it was only a little bit after that that. Indonesians really felt that they were truly independent. So, this characteristic of the culture of being mm-hmm. deferential and that's just a challenge, or that's just, a, that's just something you have to be sensitive to. But what are some of the other challenges when you think about the country of Indonesia that, that Indonesia faces, both internally or externally, that, that are the big ones that folks talk about? Some of the big challenges. Um, for right now, or okay. um, I saw from now from what I saw, because I still uh, we always me and my husband we always uh, read the newspaper from Indonesia. We try to connect with the media from Indonesia, so we try to get updated everything about Indonesia. One thing that uh, for me a really big challenge right now, uh, I cannot say that Indonesian government is good. Almost everywhere, but um, if we saw that the normal thing because it just get um, uh, from the, the era of Suharto, President Suharto, which thirty years as president, and everybody uh, wants to get a change. We want change, so then it's kind of like there is a revolution, another revolution in Indonesia. So um, since that corruption thing in every segment of the government though, so big, so huge, so sad if you, if you see that. This is to be honest with you. But uh, it, it's a very little work. Uh, we, we clean it up a little by little. It's difficult, struggling, but keep going. And then we saw the progress. So that's the first challenge that I can see from five to ten years from now. That's from in, inside of the country. That's what, because, uh, you know, um, Indonesia is young. Compare with America, Indonesia is just like a young teenager. In the, just 70, almost 70 years. But America more than 200 years, right? So, kind of like uh, emotional, something like that, yes. Like teenager. So, still working on it. That, that's what, for me, that's really a challenge for us. My answer is going to be more from a business perspective. Um, there are actually quite a lot of challenges, um, of course, a lot of opportunities as well. But among the biggest challenges is true corruption. Um, during when Suharto, formerly General Suharto, rose to power, he uh, and his family they were very well known for amassing wealth, and it was during his time in power also that we have what's called. KKN really bloom in Indonesia. KKN KKN stands for corruption, collusion, and nepotism. So people around him, close to him, associated with him, friends with him, became very wealthy. Uh, a lot of them are also uh, military members of the military. The military has played a very distinct and important role throughout the history of Indonesia. So, uh, Transparency International does a confidence perception, a corruption perception index. I believe last year we ranked 114. A little bit better than before, a couple of years before that it was 118. So, we, we're not doing that well. <laughs> uh, the good news is we have an organization that is called KPK, which is the agency that tries to eliminate, I don't know if you can completely eliminate, but it tries to eliminate corruption. And if you ask any Indonesian or anybody doing business in Indonesia, they will tell you they have beef. 
it's not just the name. They have arrested government officials. They have assisted milit- uh, arrested military commanders. They don't really care who you are, so they're trying to do a good job. Um, another challenge is poverty. About 60 million out of Indonesia's population of 240 million, um, with the world's fourth largest, most populous nation uh, in the world, about 60 million are at the poverty level or below, and that that presents a lot of challenges, as you might understand. Um, infrastructure is very poor. Uh, our main airport in Jakarta, for instance, has been operating at way beyond capacity for about eight years now. Um, We don't have very good transportation, so much so that goods that have to travel outside of Jakarta, say they they arrive at the main port in Jakarta, the prices can be very, very much higher. Um, So it affects the cost of doing business. You have this roads that cannot keep up, you have ports that cannot keep up, you have airports that cannot keep up. The good news is our economy has been doing well. The bad news is it puts a lot of demand on the country's infrastructures. Um, Floods. There is an index that measures the world's most flood-prone cities. Jakarta is up there along with Manila and Dhaka. so it's a big problem for um, companies. A lot of them have production facilities in Indonesia, and when you have big areas affected, then what happens is it affects your supply chain. Uh, um, <laughs> I think that those are some of the main ones. And this year is election year. We're going to have legislative elections, and we're going to have presidential elections. So generally, Indonesia has had has enjoyed political stability, but people are a little bit concerned about what's going to happen because the current president who has had, I think, three terms in office, he cannot run again. Thank you. Um, both of you mentioned earlier the multiplicity of languages and religions in Indonesia. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role of religion. Um, one thing we, I, it's mentioned on, if you got one of the handouts as you came in the room, uh, Indonesia has the largest Muslim population of any country in the world. Indonesia is, I think, the third or fourth largest, third largest democracy in the world, uh, fourth largest country in general in terms of population. But I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role that religion plays in Indonesian society. So in Indonesia, um Yes, that we are the, the largest population for a Muslim in the world, but Indonesia is not a Muslim country. That's number one. Indonesia is not a Muslim country. Indonesia is a democratic republic country. So uh, in Indonesia, uh, we accept all, uh, not all, uh, we accept uh, differences, not only about the culture, but also in the, in the in the um, for religion. So, uh, for example, for the um, holiday, holiday for uh, for kids and for us as employees, um, we celebrate uh, not like uh, particularly for kids uh, in America during the summer time, no school, right? In Indonesia, no. We only uh, our kids only get a break about two weeks, but uh, we celebrate a uh, week. A week off during the Christmas, and then Hindus, Hindus, uh, uh, New Year, Hindus New Year, and then uh, Islamic New Year, and then Chinese New Year, and then also the kind of like we have uh, we celebrated Dukhi Tree if you if you know about that, and uh, Idul Adha, and all of the the important day, the most important day for the every religion. Exist in Indonesia because not every religion exists in Indonesia. Um, all of the very important day that exists for except for the religion that exists in Indonesia, we accept it and then we we respect it and we take off it for school and then for office. Yeah. So um, having said that, 
in Indonesia, in, I think in every household, we, uh, we practice religion. Our own religion, Islam or Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or even China. Uh, maybe this is the first time probably you hear Kong Hu Chu. That's one of the religion from uh, Paris. Kong Hu Chu probably the first time you heard that. So uh, every house called they practice religion, and then that's the way they they, um, they teach their their kids. That's the best. At the base, base of how we teach our kids, like my parents, hey honey, um, no, don't do that. It's not good. It's against our religion. Our religion never uh, teach you to do that. Okay. Something like that. Um, so, if you see in, in Indonesia, why all of Indonesia, the first time I, I met Sister Anita, I called her Sister Anita and she called me Sister Dia. Because we both Muslim, and in Muslim, uh, in Islam, uh, as long as you are the same Muslim, no matter how you come from whatever country, you are brother and sister. So that's one of the symbols. Many things, but I cannot explain everything in the, in the short time, probably. I'm going to add a different angle. This is the historical perspective. We had. Um, Buddhist empires, we had Hindu empires, and we've also had Islam spread uh, in Indonesia. The Portuguese came, the Dutch came, the British came. They all wanted the resources, and they all brought with them the religions. Islam was the first thing that really unified the country of Indonesia. By then, Islam had taken root. Um, even um, the British Empire in Southeast Asia, their base was in Malacca, in Malaysia, uh, and that's because of trade, because of, you know, they have the Straits of Malacca right there. Well, Malacca became uh, Muslim, I can't remember in which century, but Mal Malacca was Muslim. Uh, so, anyway, um, We've mentioned a few times that the Dutch were in Indonesia for a long time. The very first uh, pseudo-political party that was formed in Indonesia was called Sarikat Islam. Uh, it, it, I call it a pseudo-political party because it was what rallied people was the fact that they were against the Dutch colonialists, but it wasn't really their agenda wasn't so much self-rule. The very first real um, political party was the party started by uh, Sukarno, and that was uh, Partai Nasional Indonesia. It's the Indonesian National Party, and again, um, Indonesia was a strong force. But when when uh, everybody really gathered uh, at the at the end of the colonial era. It was Islam that really the people. Again, it was easy to do because most of the population um, is, is Muslim. Uh, I can't say that um, it was Islam that, that helped Indonesia become independent because, again, we are a multinational, multi-ethnic uh, country. One of the one of the major political parties at that time, which is a very tumultuous time in our history, was PKI, which was the Communist Party, actually. Okay. Um, does the distinction between Sunni and Shiite have mean anything in Indonesia? We, we hear about that all the time here. It's like in the news whenever we talk about Islam in the, in the, re in the Middle East region. Um, does it mean anything in Indonesia? Um, Everywhere in this world, uh, there is um, a group that they know, a group that they know. I agree with you, I don't agree with you. So, Sunni and Shia in Islam, most of Muslim, I mean, sorry, uh, most of Muslim in Indonesia, we don't really care. We are Sunni or not Yes, uh, a little of uh, community is thing about that, but most of Muslim in Indonesia, we don't really care. Because 
Islam is Islam. Islam is religion. So we believe in one God. We use the same, we read the same holy book. And in the holy book, it's really clearly stated that uh, if you are Islam, if you are a Muslim, so you are a brother and sister. So in Indonesia, we don't really care about that. Most of us don't really care about Sunni or Shia. Growing up, nobody mentioned to me that there were Sunnis and Shiites. I was just told that there were Muslims. So that's how little it mattered. <laughs> so when I was first asked that question, I really didn't know what to say. Um, there are some places in the world where obviously it makes a huge difference, but not in Indonesia. Um, we do have the people who are on the fringe, but, you know, there's so few of them. Um, by and large, Muslims throughout the world see themselves as one big brotherhood. That's why if, say, something happens to Muslims in one country, you'll see Muslims in completely other part of the world being very much affected by it. Having said that also, um, it's not just that the differences between Shiite and, and Sunni uh, Islam don't matter. The differences generally between religions don't matter to most Indonesians. I have Indonesian friends who are Christians who are like family to me. When they call me, they say, Assalamu alaikum, which is, you know, a greeting, peace be upon you. Christmas, I'm with their family at home, opening presents, celebrating with them. And that's how it is in Indonesia as well. My mom, my grandmother was a very, very, very strict Muslim. And she was the principal uh, at, a, at a school in Makassar, Jumpandang in uh, Sulawesi. Uh, okay, I have this point, I'm going to use it now. There you go. <laughs> that's Sulawesi. <laughs> Looks like a dinosaur to me. She, with a very religious mother, was sent to school at a Catholic school. That's how little we care about these things. Um, I celebrated Diwali or Diwali with my Hindu friends. Um, Chinese New Year, I know so much about Chinese culture, and then late in my life I discovered I'm about 2% Chinese anyway. <laughs> but um, that's how religion is viewed in Indonesia. It is a, it's, it, it's a guiding principle in our lives. It, it helps form our values and perceptions, but it, it's not contentious. If you travel to Jakarta, visit um, the biggest mosque in Southeast Asia is Istiqlal. It's beautiful. Not far from that is the biggest Catholic mosque. Very beautiful as well. Yeah, probably I can add a little bit more. Um, for example, um, if you were, if my husband and I, we, we really love to be traveling. We, we have been going from north to south, uh, west to east, and in, in Indonesia. And in the time, because we as a Muslim, we have to pray five times a day, right? So when the praying time is coming, we can stop at whatever most that's available there. We just stop and then do the, do the praying thing and then go. Nobody will gonna stop you. No, don't, don't do that. This is not your so we don't really care about it to the NCR. Yeah. Maybe for little community to think about it, but not for most of us. Um, I want to, I, I need to turn it over pretty quickly to you folks. But I want to have one last one. Before I do, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Indonesia and other countries. And I guess I'll start with the U.S. Um, and this is one of those big, broad questions, and I realize there's you can talk to a dozen people and get a dozen of answers, but I'm just talking to the two of you. So, how would you say, how do Indonesians feel about the United States, and do they feel that the U.S. has played a positive role in Indonesia's development, economic, political, whatever? Um, the first thing that I Indonesia get our independence and our success. So, uh, not helped by any country, not um, not helped by any organization. Our our leaders at the time uh, bring our country to be independent by ourselves. So, having 
say that at the very first era of the first president, Indonesia doesn't even really get along with the United States. And then uh, the second era of the president, which is from the first one, uh, Mr. Sukarno, and then the second Mr. Sukarno, at the time, the political view changed. Indonesia became close with the United States, uh, but uh, have a politici- political issue with China because of the um, China uh, because of the We democratic country, Vietnam. Com- communist, communist, yeah, because of the communist thing. So, and then since then, I think uh, Indonesia and USA uh, has a very good, we have a very good um, relationship. One thing that I would like to share, this is the truth. When Mr. Obama uh, be a president of America, most of Indonesian people, they're so proud, they're happy. Why? Because Mr. Obama used to live in Indonesia for three years. So they feel that, oh, kind of like a diaspora of Indonesia now being a president in the United States. So at the day when Mr. Obama, uh, uh, the day of the celebration, everybody there, almost everybody there also, also celebrated so proudly. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so, um, but um, if you, if you want to know uh, how big the, uh, the influence from the United States helping uh, development in Indonesia, to be honest to you, I don't know. But what I know, Indonesia uh, has the IGGI. IGGI is uh, one of the organizations that help Indonesian development. Uh, it's not only America, it's European and some other countries. So, so, but how many percentage, to be honest, I don't know. I think you will get different answers from people uh, from different generations. It depends on what they have to go through at, you know, during a significant point in their lives. Um, Post-World War II, the U.S. was not seen as a friend, as the Madhya mentioned, uh, because they were providing financial aid to Netherlands uh, to help them recover from you know, all the war efforts. Um, at that time also, our first president, Sukarno, had a pretty aggressive foreign policy. He was obviously very anti-imperialist. Um, the U.S. was behind uh, the Dutch being able to recover. They also had bases in the Philippines. And so that was not a particularly good time for both countries. After that, when Suharto became president, Indonesia saw amazing economic growth. Uh, when Sukarno became president of Indonesia, it was a new country that was in absolute taxes after colonization, after war, after internal struggles for succession between, you know, the different kingdoms. Um, And so it wasn't a very easy time economically. Um, When Suharto came uh, into the presidency, He aggressively sought foreign investment, and America was obviously one of the sources where we got that. A lot of, um, well, I think the first companies were oil and gas companies that were, that had already been in the country in a long time, but then he really opened the doors to foreign investment and um, and things improved. During the Cold War, what was happening uh, in, in the U.S. between America and the Soviet Union affected us too. Um, well, because if you look at, for instance, um, Tanayan Stadium that was funded with Soviet money, the reason it was such is because um, 
the Americans were starting to pull away from Indonesia. There's no way to tell to make this story short. At the time, um, PKI, the Communist Party, was doing quite well. Uh, the was before communism was completely routed in Indonesia. And so there was some level of distrust. Uh, technically, yes, yes, it was, the Cold War was, what, 53 to 63, so around 1960. Personally, on a personal level, one of my uncles, um, who eventually today is one of the more prominent people in Indonesia, at the time he was in America on an exchange program. But he had to just cut his program short. He got sent back because relationships between America and Indonesia had thought so much that it was just, you know, terminated. Eventually, he got to come back, but it was because his host family, who later adopted him, grandfather was, um, I think, not mayor of Buffalo, New York, but you know, something like that. He was. He was uh, in, in a position where his wife could cause enough trouble. She was writing to, you know, Congress, to the Senate, to everybody she could write to, and eventually he came back. But that's why I mean, that's what I meant when I said it depends on who you talk to uh, and what was happening between America and Indonesia uh, during significant times in their life. Um, now it's very good. If you go to Indonesia, you hear American music, you see American culture everywhere. We even have rap, and that's not Indonesian. <laughs> Um, how does, in, 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 from your experience and your friend, how does Indonesia get along with its other countries in the neighborhood? And without naming them, just, I mean, the, the nearby countries, I'll even leave out the U.S., the nearby countries, how does Indonesia get along? Um, Indonesia, um, one of the founding members together with other four countries, uh, uh, the third organization, Called as uh, Asian Association of Southeast Asia Nations, so which the member right now becomes ten countries. So um, it really depends on what side, which side that you see. But if we get along, we do get along with everybody because we get along with all ourselves, right? So um, and also Indonesia because of the the largest Muslim population in the world we also uh, get along with all of the Muslim countries, although we are not Muslim countries. But we get along, we, we call it uh, Oki in Indonesia, but I think in, in uh, international uh, acronym is uh, CIO, uh, I'm not sure, OCI. Um, it's about the organization that all of the Indonesia, uh, all of the Islam community. Uh, country, so I think of if you ask about get along or not, but we also have to have little friction with uh, Malaysia uh, about the pattern thing. We have the same pattern, 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 pattern. Yeah, sorry, my pronunciation. So, um, like uh, we have the same food. Indonesian thought is Indonesian rendang. Rendang is uh, the traditional food from uh, Indonesia. But Malaysia also thought that no, Rendang is from Malaysia. So, but Malaysia uh, moved more uh, one step ahead of us. They patterned that Rendang thing, and Indonesia said, "By the way, I think it's our food." So something like that. It's that small thing, but it sometimes it's by the people, not between the government, but people, people. people. I'm not going to go to war for that. I might have a food fight, but not going to go to war. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Indonesians and food. <laughs> um, that's a very good point. Indonesia was one of the founding members in 1967 of ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN now has uh, 10 member states. What is most significant about ASEAN is that they are pressing for economic, uh, among other things, economic integration by 2015. So you're going to see something very similar to what the, uh, the Europeans have done, have done with the European Union, except this is it's called the ASEAN Economic Community, AEC. So 2015. It's the Asian Economic the Community. The Southeast Asian nations, I think. Yeah, ASEAN, right. So uh, one of their priorities is ASEAN Economic uh, Community, I think just call it AEC, and the target for that is 2015, which means that 
come 2015, there will be no barriers to trade, for instance, whether it's tariff or non tariff That's a very big deal. Right now, of course, everybody competes for the same business. What they want to do is make sure that, that we are competing smartly and we're competing at the region. Um, yes, we do have our troubles. Um, but yeah, mentioned uh, Malaysia. I see it kind of like sibling rivalry, you know. A lot of us have a sister or brother we <laughs> don't like very much. We love them, but we hate them. So we have that sort of relationship with some of our neighbors. Generally, um, one of the things that the organizers of ASEAN will probably tell you is since the beginning of ASEAN, there has never been any war among any of the countries in that region, and they plan to keep it that way. Um, things do happen from time to time. Um, for people in the aviation industry, the Singapore Air Show just happened about a week or two ago. Um, it's one of the premier air shows in the world. Typically, Indonesia features very big. Um, in fact, at the last one, two years ago, I was there, we stole the headlines because of the big um, contract, $36 million uh, with Boeing. That world commercial history, aviation history. Uh, but at this recent one, no Indonesian officials attended because um, two new, I don't know if they're new, but two Navy ships have been given names that offend the Singapore government. They are the names of two Marines who are heroes to Indonesians. The Singaporeans are unhappy because uh, I think it was in 1965 uh, when we had, Sukarno had the aggressive foreign policy, uh, Singapore was then part of the Federation of Malaya, um, and we were friends. Uh, Sukarno had sent uh, those two Marines to form a particular building on the main street, Orchard Road, if you know Singapore. So just by virtue of that fact, you do have problems coming up every once in a while. But that is so few, so far between, generally, um, there's harmony, there's peace, and there's a lot of cooperation, as you can see with ASEAN. Before I open up the floor, do either one of you have anything to say about Indonesia's relationship with China? Actually, my husband, my lovely husband, a part half of his in his blood is China. My mother-in-law is China. <laughs> my mother-in-law is China. This is how diverse our family is. If we, if we, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in a big celebration, uh, like uh, Idul Fitri after the Ramadan fasting, and you can see that uh, all of the family, many family from my mom's side come by to, uh, to my house, and they're not actually Muslim. Some of, some of them are Christian or Confucius that I told you, and then a few of these Hindus. But uh, in, in in our family, we don't have issue. But for as a country, I think um, the political issue, uh, the political view of Indonesia is free and active. Yes. We call it bebas uh, abdat active, so free and active. So I think uh, what I saw right now is uh, more open more open-minded, more uh, think outside the box. That's what I saw from what I read uh, in the newspaper. But I don't know whether we already get there as a friend or not. To be honest with you, I don't know. But... Are you yeah. What do you mean by that? That's an uh, uh, Indonesian political uh, view. Uh, view of what? Uh, for the... Uh, for the with the neighbors in China? Yes. Okay. Not only for the China, but... Uh, for everybody, and every, any other country. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not quite sure how to put it, so I'm just going to say it like it is. There was a time when um, <laughs> relations with China were very bad with Indonesia. Um, as I mentioned, the Communist Party was one of the main parties in Indonesia, of course. Uh, with a lot of backing from Russia and from China. In fact, I think outside of Russia and China, it was the third biggest communist party in the world. Um, and 
uh, a visit from the then Chinese Premier, I believe, 1965, uh, sparked, sparked, yeah, I can't remember, it was 1965, sparked a very bloody part of our history. Um, at that time, it was during the presidency of Sukarno, one of the ideologies that greatly influenced his thinking was actually socialism and in, in terms of believing in social justice. And so we had very good relationships with China at the time, but the premier came and he said that Indonesia should have a fifth force in the armed forces instead of your army, just army, navy, um, air force, and right, the, the, uh, I don't the last one is not coming to me, but he said it should be just a people, armed people force. So Karna said, why not? A lot of people said no. <laughs> and so that sparked a really ugly uh, time in our history, and then after that relationship went south. Fast forward to today. Today, China is one of our major trading partners. Whether China does well or not affects whether we do well or not. In fact, one of the reasons why um, our forecast for GDP growth uh, are shrinking is because China's economy is shrinking. So we do live in that interconnected world, and our leaders and our people recognize that. Okay, thank you. That's great. Um, I would like to open it up to your questions for what we do, but we're going to do two things here. We've got, for those of you who want to ask, and the Eloise is going to run around with the microphone, and if you prefer to just write your question down on the card, and somebody will be running around catching this card, and we answer. So. When I uh, compare your economic statistics to the United States, you seem to be in a lot better. Your unemployment rate is about two percentage points lower than ours. Your poverty rate is about two-thirds of ours. Your growth rate is about 100% greater, two times greater than ours. If you look ahead five or ten years and talk to your friends, what do you see? Do you see that continue? You have to slow down that moment. Do you see that picking up in the future, or do you think it's going to continue to slow down? I'm going to bring out my crystal ball. <laughs> uh, yes, we are, we, not just Indonesia, but most developing countries uh, in that part of the world are doing very much better than America and Europe. Uh, these countries that used to be superpowers, that used to be economic superpowers, are now languishing. They are growing at 2%, maybe 3%, some 1%, some are not even growing, they're going the other way. But if you look at the numbers for developing countries, if you look at the numbers for uh, for Indonesia, we've been growing at about between 6 to 7%. So it's a huge difference. Um, looking forward five to ten years, I really don't know about ten years, but I'm going to try and say for five years, I think we will still be ahead because it's going to take a long time to recover. You've got structural problems that take a long time to fix. A country like Indonesia, though, what's amazing is we have corruption, we have poor infrastructure, we have blah, blah, blah. You can name all the challenges, but the economy is still going this way. That's because, you know, we have so many other factors going for us, and those factors are going to keep, you know, um, helping us going forward. To be honest, um, about the economic things, you said, I you know, way above me. But what I saw right now, because my parents, you know, they are in a business, uh, not big, but enough, but... Uh, in a business time. And then I saw uh, when my my dad just came back, came uh, for vacation with us three months ago, and then I, I had a time to talk with my daddy. And then he said that, yeah, it's, it's growing, growing, and then um, uh, better, become better and better. And which, this, this is the, from the closest family that I know, so I don't know, uh, 
Uh, my knowledge is not as large as Jitter Anita with economy, but from the closest uh, family that I know, my which my parents, and then he said uh, it's become better and better. I really hope it's going better and better. All um, Indonesians carry ID identification cards, and these identification cards uh, it has their religion on it. Why is that? I don't know why, but yes, that's true. Uh, in our in our uh, ID card. We said in our ID card, uh, we have that religion. Um, one connection that I can think of um, in Islam, we only allowed to marry with Muslim. So I don't know is there any connection between that or not? I don't know. But uh, yes, for some country, religion is none of my business. It's your own business. But in Indonesia, we have it in our ID card. But I don't know why uh, we have it. I did not grow up in Indonesia. I grew up in Singapore. And for a long time, I carried Singapore ID. I have Indonesian ID. I have American ID. In Singapore, they have information like religion as well. In that part of the world, one of the biggest culture shocks for me moving here was how to write a resume that worked because it's very different from how it's done in, in um, Indonesia, for instance. When you submit your resume, you have to include a photograph. You have to tell them what your gender is. You have to tell them whether you're married or not. You have to tell your, your prospective em employer what religion is. So I believe culturally we just have different ideas about what's shareable and what's not. You know, we, and we don't have uh, <laughs> we don't have to worry about being sued over there if you're a, if you're a company. You know, you don't have um, non-discrimination laws the way they are practiced here. And generally, as a country, Indonesia is so non-PC. We have no hang-ups over things like race and religion. In fact, if you ask an Indonesian what they joke about, they joke about each other's race. <laughs> so that's my step at, the, at, at why um, we have religion on there, because they do just think that it's okay to collect information about people at that granular level. But, you know, my, my BIA might have said something that, that's pretty significant, too. I have a follow-up on that. One more here. Um, Ninety-five percent of the Chinese are citizens of Indonesia. At the same time, the government has attempted to repress Chinese culture by banning Chinese language publications at schools. I know you can a very nice picture of the society. Is this still going on today? Yeah, I remember that when I was small, um, uh, I, I grew up in Alemba, uh, kind of like a small city like Seattle in here. Um, at the time, because Palembang is a bit kind of like a uh, business city, we are more to the trading activities. So at the time, I think I heard many people speak in Chinese, but that's not the not allowed in in the school. That's what I, I understand at that time, and also not allowed in the uh, office area. Um, I don't know now because I have been living in my country for so many years, almost ten years. Um, but Chinese is different country. This is my pers my own perspective. Chinese is different country. Yeah. So Chinese language is not a part of Indonesian language. This is this is my again, this is my own my own uh, opinion. 
if we speak a Germanese or one one of the uh, from Indonesia, uh, from from the Sumatra, from we we, we speak Ma- Malay, we speak uh, kind of like a Bata or whatever. In the in the office, you just find if you talk with your friend, hey, uh, you come from Palembang, yeah, I come from Palembang, yeah. and then we just have to speak our our own uh, hometown language. That's fine, but uh, when we go out, we speak Indonesia. So um, I don't think that China is a China language is banned, but it's not it's not just not um, Indonesian language. So you can speak Chinese. But not in a formal, in a formal uh, condition. That's that my understanding, my my own opinion. I'm going to go back to my youth again. I grew up in Singapore, which is largely Chinese, so I had a lot of uh, Chinese friends around me, um, and I didn't travel very much to Indonesia when I was growing up. When I made friends with Indonesians um, who were Chinese. I was very surprised to find out they were Chinese if you don't look over the Chinese uh, because their names are not Chinese. So this is a question I've been asked many, many, many times in my life as an Indonesian. Today, um, I think a few months ago, I was in Singapore in a food court. I sat next to a Chinese family and, you know, pretty soon they figured out I was Indonesian and we had a conversation and what was really lovely was the fact that they were so proud of the fact that they were Indonesian. They don't see themselves as Indonesian Chinese. They saw themselves as Indonesian. And um, so today's uh, social integration and cohesion, I can say, is a uh, very high level. It's very good. But, you know, I l- alluded to a particularly bloody and unhappy part of our history that was where the antagonism against Chinese, all things Chinese, started. Because, you know, communism, a lot of the support was from Soviet uh, Union and from China. And we, back then, under Sukarno, had a very good relationship with China. Um, but, you know, when, when the Chinese premier had suggested that, that basically started civil war in Indonesia. Um, the PKI, in 1955, um, Sukarno, 55, uh, 55 the first election, um, because originally in 1949, Sukarno wasn't elected. And then in 1955 was when they, you know, went through this election process. Uh, Sukarno won, you know, by far, but it became very clear that PKI had a lot of support. None of the political parties uh, had more than, say, about a quarter of the population's vote, so they needed to form coalitions. Um, but when Suharto came into power, he was obviously um, a nemesis of Suharto, and he was not pro-communist, communism, and when his rise to power was associated with the communists in Indonesia being routed, this is something, there are some words in every culture, in every country that are raw. In Indonesia, one of them is this, communism, Chinese. Um, and so it was a time when uh, pretty much commun- communist sympathizers, uh, communist party members, anything to do with that ideology was basically vanquished from, from Indonesia. And part of the effort to... Uh, increased social cohesion between people was, I believe, to take away things that were overtly Chinese. Uh, uh, so, I, I bring in my body, I kind of have a bit of experience traveling and working in Indonesia and with Indonesians, right? and I, I love Right. And but um, so I hope my question is maybe less. Um, well, you're, you're, you're co founder of the Indonesian Diaspora Foundation, and I found now that I'm interested in Indonesia that I don't meet very many Indonesians in this area. 
and it seems like there's not a lot of Indonesians that come to the United States or Washington compared with, you know, the many other immigrants and foreign students and stuff. So I'm curious if you could tell us more about the Indonesian community that exists around the Seattle area and about and in America, and um, why does it seem like there's less Indonesians who come here to immigrate for study, work, etc.? Um, um, we just start uh, in, uh, we, our former um, ambassador, uh, ambassador, Mr. Dino Patijala. Um, he initiated diaspora organizations with us um, because he saw that Indonesian people went uh, go spread around the world. But uh, we don't have one organization that we can recognize. So um, we are working on it. Yes, we do have a, a group of little community, little community, little community. But now we are trying to uh, bring everybody together. You still exist with your community, but in one day or uh, one particular condition, we are one, something like that. So that's why uh, we uh, we create one organization, uh, Indonesian Diaspora Network. Indonesian Diaspora Network is for the, the whole Indonesian Diaspora around the world, and then we have Indonesian Diaspora uh, United States, and then and then uh, Mr. Ambassador asked me to uh, create one organization, uh, very young organization, still toddler. So, um, Indonesian Diaspora uh, uh, Network Greater Java. So, we are still working on it. We not even uh, uh, have our bylaw still in concept, still draft. But um, we try to uh, have a good organization to bring all of Indonesia together. So, Back to your question, why a very little population of Indonesian people that try to come to America? Um, I think there's many reasons, many, many reasons. Um, most of people that come into America, they are rich. Students. Uh, most of Indonesian parents in Indonesia cannot afford to send their kids. Because uh, the the living cost so expensive, right? and then um, the economy there. Yes, we are growing up, but probably uh, this is the reality. The average uh, income for United States uh, how much? Five thousand a month? Six thousand? About that? In Indonesia, probably only five hundred dollars. So they cannot afford to send it. Unless if the kids are from the rich um, family or they're so brilliant and they get the source scholarship. Yeah. And uh, I think I think that's one one of the reasons. So I don't say many other reasons, but I, I saw that's the reason why uh, probably wow Indonesia student international student from Indonesia very little compared with Korea, probably we compared with China, but that's the situation that we have. I gather you would like to get to know more Indonesians in the area. If you do, come say hello to us afterwards. The Indonesian Diaspora Network is for Indonesians living overseas and people who who have history or have love for Indonesia, that would include you. Um, we have community events throughout the year. Some of them are student events, some of them are organizational events, so we'd be happy to get you plugged in. Um, you know, today, uh, Larry was just, Larry, somebody was asking me why there are not more Indonesian restaurants. It was you, that's right. Somebody said, are there any Indonesian restaurants in Seattle? I said, not that I know of. So, um, there's a no cafe, um, and that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, well, pretty 
much greater Seattle too. Um, and so I wondered about this myself, and my conclusion is the um, demographic of the Indonesians that come here and also um, our socioeconomic condition in Indonesia. If you look at other, um, say, Asian ethnic groups that come here, a lot of them come and mass through mass migrations for either political asylum, you know, and when they come, they bring their families in hordes with them. So they form large communities. It's no problem finding, say, a Vietnamese restaurant, right? Um, but not so for Indonesia. If you look at the, the profile of Indonesians here, a lot of them come here to work or to study. They might stay a little bit, but they all want to go home and they don't bring their entire families here. There are some people who grow permanent roots, but they're not the majority. We haven't had a huge slide, you know, of Indonesians coming to America or anywhere else. Uh, a lot of the people who grow roots are people who actually marry Americans. Um, that's probably the reason why. I hope I've answered your question. Let me ask one question that I got here with you because it's a real nice follow-up to that. I'll be right back here. The question was, the question was, the, at least it seemed that the majority of, what well, you point out, uh, Indonesia is a Muslim country, but most of the students that come to study in the United States, and that certainly is true here at, at this college, are Christians. And the question is, why? What are the reasons that are, there are not more Muslims from Indonesia coming to study in the United States, at this fine institution in particular? Very good question. That's the reality. Um, most of the students that come here, uh, they are hard to say, but um, a part of their, their parents will be a part of the Marchand. So we just in Indonesia, the business activities there, most of the, the biggest company or, or the the strong, the strong businessman in Indonesia are Chinese. Chinese, yeah. Most of them are Christian. Although part of my family they are Chinese, but they are very strong Muslim. But Chinese. Um, I already compare because my parents uh, uh, from Indonesian origin, really, really Indonesian people, and they go more to the government and then educate them but not in the business, not strong in business. So in Indonesia, people who strong in business think that most of, the, more, most of them are Chinese. And then most of the Chinese in Indonesia is Muslim. Yeah, I think Madia touched on a big part of it. Um, the business class in Indonesia, a large part of it is Chinese. Um, I would, I, I reckon a lot, some of it has to do with that period of economic growth uh, during about 30 years of Suharto's uh, rule. A lot of his uh, close business associates were Chinese, and so they, they did very well. But the other thing is, if you know anything about Chinese culture, they're very, very hardworking entrepreneurial people. Anywhere they go, you, you go, you'll find a kind of town that's bustling, you'll find tiny businesses, they thrive. And so, you know, they, they form a large part of the business class uh, in Indonesia. A downside is when we had the Asian financial crisis, for instance, because of the huge disparity of wealth, they suffered the brunt of tensions and people's frustrations. But what is undeniable is the fact that they have by and large always done well, and so they are the ones who can afford to spend. If you look at the exchange rate between Indonesian rupiah and American um, dollar, you get to have an understanding of just how expensive it is for the average Indonesian um, to send their kids overseas, even to some place nearby like, like Singapore. It is, it is prohibitive. Yeah, I'm wondering about well, actually, I'm wondering about pre-Christian and pre-Islamic movement in the area there. Now, there, as you mentioned, there are many different peoples, many different languages spread out through the islands. I was wondering if you know anything about yeah, pre-Christian and pre-Islamic culture 
journey about their creation stories, how the, cre- how the world was created, the way I believed that before Christianity and Islam came over there. You may or may not know that. And so just a, yes, so just basically. Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't really know detail about that, but uh, before, a long, long time ago, hundreds years ago, um, basically there are, uh, there are two big uh, kingdoms in Indonesia, which is Majapahit and Sriwijaya, the name of my university, probably. So, um, they both Hindu. Hindu. So, and then, um, after that, uh, the colonialism, this is what I understand, Colonial, uh, Christians come to Indonesia uh, together with colonialism, come to Indonesia. And, uh, but we, uh, before that, Islam came during the Mataram Kingdom, you know? So, and um, if you see in this, in this uh, map, so we have very strong uh, Muslim along this Muslim population in India, but in this area, in Medan and the Sumatra Utara, uh, some Muslims, some uh, Catholic uh, Christian, and then in here Muslim, and then in here most Muslim, but in this area, uh, Christian. Yeah. So in here Jakarta and uh, in this, uh, Java is mixed, but. Uh, more to this area, a little in the a little bit east of the center Java, a lot of Christian over there. There's a Solo, it's called Siki and Solo. Uh, most of the population in that is Christian. So basically, it's just everywhere we can see Christian in here, but Muslim in here, Christian in here, Muslim in here, Christian in here, most of here. We have very little uh, community in this area that was them, but I think get along. And then in here, most of here, uh, Muslim and then Christian, Christian. So, yeah, I think that's, that's the, the history that I understand. Uh, Christian came together with the colonial. So we, uh, but yeah, that's right, we were... We were influenced by um, Hindu, Buddhist, and Muslim empires. Um, and she's named some of some of the more prominent ones. Um, Borobudur, for instance, which is in Georgia, uh, it's a huge Buddhist temple complex. Came from one of those times. Before that, Indonesians were enemies. They worship forces of nature. They believe that um, things, both animate and inanimate, have soul um, and spirit. And that partly explains why, to this day, Indonesians are highly superstitious people. We still believe in souls and spirits for various reasons. And um, through through, uh, our history, our leaders also have demonstrated and our people have demonstrated that while they have um, embraced religions like Christianity and Islam and Hinduism, very often it's a different brand from where it came from. Hinduism is largely practiced in Bali, for instance, but Bali Hinduism is very different from Hinduism in India, where it came from. even as in Islam, you see things like Sunni Shiite differences don't mean anything to us. Um, and same with Christianity. I travel to a place called Tana Toraja. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. This is Sulawesi. Half of me is from there. <laughs> my family, uh, my mom's family is from there. Somewhere around the middle southern area is where Tana Toraja is. They are very famous for their funeral rites. Um, a lot of them are Christians, some are Muslims, but when they die, their funeral practices have nothing to do with Christianity. You know, some, they, they, they slaughter buffalo, for instance, to guide the uh, departed person to their place in heaven. 
So it's, it's a syncretized version of the religion, and it's been completely assimilated with whatever existed before, and you have that brand of the different uh, religions being practiced to this day. But I don't know about creation uh, beliefs. Excuse me, I would like to ask, uh, what, what is the number one thing that you would uh, say slows down Indonesian progress where they don't have to be independent with other countries? Independent with other countries, you say you survive off of uh, China, what they do. So what, what's one thing you think slows down the progress? And uh, I have two questions. Uh, you, you say your ID cards say you don't have a religion on them and everybody gets along, but you know, who, who really carries the burden of uh, I'm sorry, um, you mean that uh, relative to the The burden is an issue too. Wow, that is a really, really, really good question because it touches at the very heart of problems that our government is trying to solve. They've got master plans for the economy, and another one is actually to eradicate poverty. So to answer your question, poverty is one of them. It's one of the main ones. Um, if you are a company trying to decide whether or not you want to set up shop in Indonesia versus other countries, that's one of the things you consider because poverty affects the education level. And one of the biggest problems trying to start a business there, if you, if you are a, a, a big corporation, is the dearth of qualified applicants. You know, it, it's still very hard for a lot of average Indonesians to get full education. One of the Indonesian organizations here in Seattle is called Cerdas, which means smart or bright. And what that organization does is um, basically find ways to help fund education for underprivileged children in Indonesia. When you have an education, it changes everything. So um, I think poverty and related to that education is one of the big struggles. And so if you are, we call it literally translated little people, if you're one of those little people, just like anywhere else in the world, largely third world countries, you know, if you are at the bottom of the pile, you've got the deck stacked against you. It really is. I mean, there are all kinds of policies in place. Things are happening. Progress is 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 taking place. But if you ask the average or a little person, he's going to tell you life is still pretty hard because it takes a while for programs to reach them. Um, yeah, I think um, I already mentioned before that uh, the the income is uh, income per capita of Indonesian people. Very low, uh, so if they cannot afford to say that, I think that's the most, the most uh, the biggest point. That's why it's uh, so difficult for Indonesian parents to send their students, their, their kids, to get uh, education outside the country. And uh, if you see, if you just if you go to um, the car, uh, for example. You are going to see that the, the gap between the rich people and the poor people is huge, huge, very huge. And you can see it in many more cities. But um, we do see progress, although uh, the progress is not as what we expect. We expect, of course, everybody expects to get the progress as soon as possible, which is not, not easy for a country like Indonesia. Uh, but it's still there. It's still there. 
Um, I think I think that that's the root cause of the issue. Uh, hi, I'm um, actually it's not going to have a question. I just want to answer some uh, some like a uh, question from you. Why Islam is so strong in Indonesia? Because oh. Uh, Really, that transition, that's what the match with our culture because we are really down from the Dutch people. And then that Islamic coming, that's a, here we are being strong with that because our belief has matched with them. And for this, for the Chinese, between Chinese and Indonesia, uh, um, I wasn't there 2004 and 2006. Really good uh, connection, like uh, but yeah, say pre and up till today is really active. That's why they can send the non non Muslim, mostly the Christian in here, and that is because the Chinese they work very well with them. Two thousand four and two thousand six, I was in there and being a home stay for many Indonesians. Oh, I can I'm gonna see the Malay, the Indonesian face in there, the the Indonesian this Chinese business it Oh, that's what oh, um say ban about the Chinese magazine and in the public. But right now, we are open. The magazine, the Chinese magazine, Chinese in the trip also. And, oh, that guy is already leaving. Why? Uh, already left. Uh, the, what? It, because we want to know if area, why we have that? Because um, population, we cannot build in the, the trip. And we cannot build the, in the Muslim, just for the, yeah, now, the government now. Uh, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, in class, we talked about a big recession in Indonesia, and I want to know what the government did to get out of that recession, and I want to know what life was like for the common man in a, in a ready poor country. Yeah, in 1997, it was so bad, so bad, so bad, and uh, uh, riot is everywhere, and uh, with fire, with so many, oh, it, it was so bad, so bad, and um, many people killed. Uh, the reason because Indonesian people get tired in the government at that time, Thirty years have been thirty years and more. The same president, never been in the United States, right? So, and we got a very we we got very down at the time because, for example, before the crisis, uh, rupiah, our currency, uh, to U.S. dollar is only two two thousand three hundred, and then after during that crisis, it's going to sixteen thousand. So one, yeah, even reach 17, 17,000. So can you imagine how suffer all of the businessmen at the time, including my husband? So at the time, um, we we have to we have to deal with something that uh, eight times um, more expensive than it used to before. So the crisis is so bad, and then uh, but. After um, about seven years of the of the crisis, uh, we see that our economy start to grow, slow but slow but sure. And then now we used to uh, loan money from some countries, but now I, uh, the our uh, ambassador told us that now we clean all of those loans. So I think that's because um, because we know what we want 
and then we try to pursue to get it. Not easy, again, not easy, but step by step. In 1997, the economy crashed uh, in Indonesia along with other Asian economies, but Indonesia suffered uh, the worst. Um, the value of the currency plunged, banks shut down, businesses shut down. Generally, you know, when you have people of different religions, different races, they get along just fine if everything's going well. But when people are hungry, people get angry, then they start wanting to point fingers. So we started having um, a lot of uh, strife as well among the races because of that. So it was very difficult for every, pretty much everybody in the country through those few years. Um, that was also what sparked a student revolution, um, and Suharto was brought down. And we went through uh, successive presidents pretty quickly in a short time before we settled on the current president. Uh, we call him affectionately as Beye. And um, we eventually found our way through economic and political reform back to stability. Um, but it was indeed a, a, a very difficult time, and it was a combination of um, change of government uh, and change of governance that helped the country. Well, we're way past the over time again. I hope you've all really enjoyed tonight's program. And please join me in giving a round of applause to Ms. Suleiman and Ms. Dharma Watney. Thank you.